Before I dive into the 10 separate lessons, there is a lot of overlap with the experimental gameplay projects. So if you're familiar with their work, you're gonna see some lessons in here that kind of ring true from things that they have said previously. And on top of that, a lot of these lessons overlap with each other and also overlap with the other games. So I tried pulling out games that kind of embodied the different lessons fully. These games are all non-commercial. They provide me with this wonderful backlog of games, so now I can kind of look at the things that went right and the things that went wrong for pushing forward, which is great. And also, uh, the one thing I did not expect, but kind of came out of it, is that I have a really good understanding of my own voice. I know what I like to make, and I kind of know how to make these experiences fast. So those are kind of immediate snippets, uh, outcomes that came from it. So, jumping into the lessons. Uh, there's many more lessons than the ones that I'll be talking about today. Uh, it's it's Ooh, there's a lot, it's five years. Um, but the ones that I am talking about apply to any game, and they're skewed a little bit towards short form and audience-ready prototypes. Uh, like I was saying, these are all relatively short compared to your average uh, indie or AAA game. But these things, um, they definitely, if they don't pull in weight at the end of a game, they definitely help in the beginning when you're trying to create something off the bat and seeing if it's gonna float or not. Um, and like I was saying earlier about the pseudoscience, the way I kind of, figured out uh, the way I would weigh the success of these games is the audience reception uh, against the development time it took and my personal attachment to the project. So if it's something that I was just really gung-ho about and I couldn't go to sleep until I got it done versus something that I was just kind of like mediocre, this is a neat idea and I wanna see where it went. With that said, the lessons. Lesson one, more time in development won't save a game. This is a bit of an old adage, the idea that you can't polish a turd, um, with a little bit of a caveat being that even if your game is okay, the more time you put into it, and even if you love the game immensely, you're not gonna be able to make it much better or fix it. So, we don't actually need the volume, so that's fine. Make it easier to talk. So this is uh, my 27th game of 100. This is something that I put a ton of time into that did not pan out the way I wanted it to. Uh, 27th game, I put two months into making this thing and it only ever got 121 plays. The, the game itself is supposed to be this infinite runner. So all you have to do is pull down the right arrow and your character just keeps running. And every single time you go, it either adds distance to the track, it slows you down, it increases the wind speed. So it's this kind of, um, it, it's a riff on infinite runners because it just goes on forever. And I was really proud of this and I thought it was really clever, but you know, it didn't really go anywhere. So that was just kind of that. On the other hand, this game, Temporality, did actually fairly well. Um, it's almost the same style as the other one. The difference is that you can press the right and arrow keys. When you don't press anything, time pauses. When you press one, time moves forward. You press the other key, time moves backwards. Uh, it, I'm, I'm sure it actually took a lot less coding to make it, and it even took less time. This was only four days, and it did immensely better. So a tip about that is limiting the game's length, not actually limiting um, you know, scope and that kind of thing, which I'll hit at later, but the game's length itself. Temporality was designed to fit one specific song, and because it fit one specific song, I could only design enough to make it fit the length of that song which means rather than the months I spent trying to make Runner better with different backgrounds that would generate and different things that would happen throughout the game to make it interesting, this game only had to be 10 minutes. And it was hard to go overboard when you have a scope that's like at the end of the day, this game's only gonna last 10 minutes and there's only so much you can put in there without it becoming overwhelming. Lesson two, you'll know if your game is going well within two days of drafting core play. Uh, and by that, I mean it'll be exciting for other people to play. The example I have for this one is uh, one of my earliest ones, Don't Kill the Cow. It's the third. It took about a month to make. And within two days of starting to make this game, I was able to show it to people and they were excited about it and they wanted to give feedback. They wanted to actually like pitch ideas for it. It was something that they saw going somewhere. It was something that they were invested in and actually wanted to like see succeed. Uh, the, the main point of this game is it, tried to, it tries to pit goals against the narrative. So the narrative is that you're this farmer and you and your wife are starving and she's asking you to kill the cow. But if you kill the cow, you'll lose. And that's pretty much all there is to it. 
Um, early on when I had the original prototype of it, you know, within the two day mark, I didn't have any of these things like water or corn or things to distract you that you could try to bring back as an offering instead of killing the cow. And it made the game a little too simple. So when I was talking to people about the game, they were suggesting things like, oh man, what if you added in this to make it like, you know, more tempting, like you can try to delay the inevitable and, you know, it kind of helped beef the whole thing up. And uh, it was just, it was really good feedback. So um, if you're ever working on a game and you want to make sure that you're heading somewhere, make sure that when you're talking to people and you show it to them, you're getting really good reception. Like even when it's super rough in its infancy stage, you should still be able to get some good feedback out of it. And it's a really good way to test if you're actually developing something that'll have an impact. So lesson three, experimental is better. And this is a little skewed. It's a little, uh, I guess, up my alley. You know, this is a... Uh, things that I'm super interested in and kind of pushed forward. Um, but in terms of working out, this has helped things find audiences. When you don't remake games and you go find your own new territory, you don't have to compete with triple A's and big indies who could conquer the same kind of territory and make the same genres, you know, but with a much larger budget and a much larger team. If you're kind of carving out your own thing, it's way easier to get attention and kind of reception. So off of that, uh, this one thing I made with my brother, Murder Clown, uh, the 40-second game, only took two days to make. And after the two days, it got picked up by Markiplier because it's a really weird game, and it turns out that's really great for YouTube Let's Players. They want like material to react to, and this kind of hit in that ball house. Uh, but on the same note, although I'm a very big fan of experimental, um, don't rely on weird because it's unstable. Uh, my 90-second game was another attempted weird game. It's an ASMR tooth adventure. So you play as a tooth, and uh, if, if you don't know what ASMR is, it's kind of this whispering with a lot of like clicking. And it's supposed to be this like weird kind of spine tingly thing. It's its own genre of YouTube videos and sounds. And I thought it'd be really cool to make an adventure game where your only clues were audio clues told by teeth that were speaking to you in ASMR. So it's this weird kind of like anxious experience. We have to just kind of deal with it if you want to know where to go and get through the plot. Um, and I don't know if it's because it was ASMR, but it didn't, it didn't get that many plays. Uh, also, for reference, whenever I make something, I always put it out through the same channels like Twitter and Facebook and, you know, post it around online, different websites. I'm always uploading to at least itch.io and Game Jolt. So these things all have effectively the same treatment when I'm releasing it. There's no kind of like weird biases for something I want to launch really well and something that I kind of expect. Uh, and with that being said, like this is the 40 second game and this is the 90 seconds. So if there was any kind of like audience growth, that is not reflected in there at all. It was just a bad game. Uh, number four, rapid development is a useful skill. So the experimental gameplay project uh, mentions that they think rapid development and um, just you know, kind of making these things quickly, cycling through them, they mentioned that it's a way of life. And I agree with that to the majority of it. I think the thing I want to add on to it is that it's also something you can kind of hone and train yourself to get better at. It's not only a way you can exist, but it's something that you can kind of perfect in your own abilities when you figure out what your niche is and when you're kind of diving into it. And the first one I have is An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. It's the ninth out of the 100. It took me three months to make. And it only has about five minutes of playtime, no levels or puzzles. Farther down the line, my 46th only took four days to make, uh, about a minute more time, and it has six different puzzle levels. And even more than that, this game, Innovative Food Company, took two weeks to make. It has 30 minutes playtime, and it has 60 puzzle levels. That's all because as I was coding these things and working on it, I had this kind of backlog of things that I could rapidly pump out, things I could quickly make and kind of introduce to games. You know, once I figure out how to get things walking left and right the way I want it to, it's really easy to implement that in the future. And once you start figuring out how to prune features and how to make these things kind of stick, it becomes really easy to start implementing that every time you want to do it from then on out. So a little tip about that one, um, try out something new in every game. Don't necessarily overload yourself. The way I was able to continue making things rapidly is that I would have one thing that I knew how to do well, 
and I would add one element new into it. If it's either a new theme, if it's a new art style, if it's like some unfamiliar code, either AI or something else going on in the background, it was just enough to make the game new as a learning experience, but it wasn't enough to push it over the edge in a way that would just be too consuming. It made it kind of, um, it made it tangible. It made it easy to kind of continue making new projects and pushing them out. So lesson five, feature pruning is as valuable as your core content. And this is something I hold really dear to my heart. Do not let um, time constraints of the project prune your features for you. Even if you have a priority list of the features you need to implement upfront and features you want to implement later on, it's best if you tackle that yourself. If you make the decisions as you're creating your games for what you want to remove and what you want to keep. Uh, you need to prune a game to make sure the message shines through the thing that you're trying to communicate to the player. And as you continue adding features to your game, that can start getting muddied. The one I have for this is Niviarum. Uh, this is a game where you had to print out an actual map to keep track of your locations in the game. So the idea is that you're this character who's lost in this complete, uh, I guess, uh, wilderness wonderland. And in order to figure out where you are, you have to keep track of little minute details on the map to kind of coordinate where you are in the game versus what you have written down. And I added a couple things since what you're seeing here. I added some little totems you find that eventually lead to like an ending. And um, <clears throat> the main point of those is that as you collect them, they all kind of give off little particles that lead you back to some point on the map. So if you ever get lost, you can kind of find your way back there. But beyond that, there were a lot of other things I wanted to have planned in here. Uh, something was like combat. I wanted you to be able to fight like woolly mammoths and other people that you find out in the wilderness. But ultimately, none of that really circulated around having the player feeling lost and having to look at this map. It kind of distracted from that feeling of, um, you know, just trying to coordinate where you are, never being quite sure you knew. It was this kind of exciting blip that would take away from that feeling that was trying to be portrayed. So ultimately, I backed off of that one. Uh, in the game, I'm thinking, I think it turned out pretty well. I'm really happy with that one. Number six, every game has a message. Begin development with a message in mind. Beginning development with a message in mind will help direct every other aspect of what you're trying to make. If you approach a game with a central theme, like Don't Kill the Cow is wanting to have the player fight against the game's narrative, the character's goals, and uh, the overarching goal to win the game, it made it way simpler to craft the game and figure out what was needed and what wasn't needed. So when you assume that your game has a message and you approach it from that, you can kind of control it. Much like the pruning aspect, if you don't figure out what your game's message is, your game's gonna have a message, you just won't be the one that shaped it. And that can go incredibly wrong sometimes. Uh, it could also go incredibly right on accident, but the chances are uh, very minimal compared to the alternative. And uh, this one's actually pretty fun. So this is another game that was shaped to music, written to a song, and it's named, you must be, you don't know the half of it, Fins of the Father. It took about a week to make, and the core of this game is pitting the player against the reason they're racing and trying to win the race. It has a lot of um, Kanye references built into it. The opening actually mirrors Bound 2, but with uh, fish everywhere. And uh, once the racing starts, you'll see that you have a mentor who's kind of spewing text at you. They're telling you that you're trying to win this race to avenge your father, and that it's really important how proud they are that you're here. But if you try to read that, it's really hard to keep track of the actual racing. So you have to balance knowing your purpose, knowing your goal for winning these races against actually winning the race. And a tip for that, when you approach any games, you should think what it could be. You want to think what your game has the potential to be. You don't want to think about what it should be. Later on, I kind of touch on some other genre things, and these are two different ways to kind of approach it. But in this case, rather than aiming for a genre, this forces you to kind of think about 
what approaches, what mechanics, what goals can you put in this game, what art style can you use that's going to supplement what you want the game to say, what you want the player to feel, rather than starting with a genre and then trying to put a lot of material onto it that won't necessarily fit it. Uh, one of the saddest things is when somebody has a really great idea for a game and then they kind of hold themselves to genre boundaries because you're ultimately constraining yourself and you're ultimately going to only inhibit what you're actually able to make if you try to think in those terms. I understand it's really hard to think outside of genres, which is why rather than trying to like break the mold of a genre, just don't even think about that. Just think about the game and think about what you could make with it, what you could turn it into. Lesson seven, what you enjoy playing may not be what you're good at making, and what you're good at making may not be what you enjoy making or playing. This one, I don't know how prevalent this one is actually as like a game designer, just general creative philosophy. I've talked with a couple people about it and it's been kind of mixed between people that knew this and people that didn't really know it. Uh, but, but the underlying reasoning is that when you want to make games, or at least when I started off, I didn't really have set genres in mind, but I knew the genres that I really liked playing. And I think the general assumption when you enjoy playing something is that you're also going to enjoy making it. And uh, that, can be, that can be very off. So I made this one later on. It's a strategy game called War on Xmas. The, uh, the whole purpose is to try to re-theme War on Xmas as Xmas is a planet uh, there's one through nine myths, and then there's X myths, and there's all these bugs invading, so you're defending the final planet. Uh, a, a bizarrely themed holiday game. So this thing has, uh, what well, was two weeks to make, it has I think maybe five or six levels, and it's a strategy game. So eventually, you start picking up other soldiers to help fight against all these bugs. It only ever had 24 plays, and strategy games are something I absolutely love but it's also something that I've discovered that I'm just absolute rubbish at designing. Uh, I mean, it has all these like little quirky elements in it, but ultimately when it's played, like it's just not that fun. You know, like all the, um, there, there's like wonderful little particles and uh, you know, these nice little moving bits left and right. And it's, I think it's pretty juicy, but it's just something that's not my wheelhouse. Alternatively, I really don't like sports games. It's like a personal thing. I just don't, I don't enjoy sports games. Um, but I made this game with my brother called EnviroGolf, which is an environmentally conscious, serene golf text game. And it's a sports game where you don't actually get to feel the sport. All your choices are picked through, uh, you just click a number, and that chooses what your putter is. So it takes a sport game, and it removes the things that people like about sports games. It's actually feeling it. On top of that, every time you swing, it gives you these wonderful little messages about how you're impacting the environment by playing golf. <laughs> and uh, you can't skip it. You have to wait till the owl or the animal comes out fully, and then you can press space and it slowly moves back. And uh, it, was, it was this weird thing, like I made this game because I thought it would be this like riff on this thing I really didn't like, and then it turned out to actually be like a pretty decent game. Um, it's something that I want to revisit in the future, like kind of expanding it out and making it more. Uh, I, don't, I haven't figured out quite how to do that yet, but um, <clears throat> that ties into the tip. Try making games in genres you don't like. Um, even if you don't like playing the genre, you might actually hit gold. You might find some way to make the genre fit what you do like, and it's pretty cool when that happens. Number eight. And this one I think might be a little controversial. Um, every baby can be thrown out with the bath water. If you want to make games, I hold pretty close that you have to be able to make multiple games. You should not have just one core idea. One core idea is not gonna be sustainable in any way, either creatively for yourself or for actually trying to publish things and get them out there. So something you have to kind of adapt is figuring out and realizing that even though you have this really, really, really good idea that you just want to cling to, there will be points that you have to toss it. There's going to be a point that if it just doesn't pan out, you have to be ready to move on to the next thing. 
I made this game uh, back when I was an undergraduate with a team of students, uh, myself included. I was the lead designer and developer on the team. And it was an idea that I was really enthused about from the beginning, uh, Mini Anda Janes. So it's, the idea was it's supposed to be like Lemmings meets Indiana Jones. So you have this parade of little adventurers that you have to navigate through obstacles. And it doesn't matter how many make it through as long as just one makes it through to the end. And it's, it's something that I would love to revisit at some point, but the, um, the problem was that it just didn't turn out all that great. Uh, you know, it's a student project, so there's no way I could kind of push it on my own. Like, I had to get everyone else's permission to do this, and a lot of people when you're on student projects don't really want to continue with certain projects. And it's, it was a thing that I was like, really enthusiastic about, and we just had to kind of let it go, um, which just happens. You have to be able to accept that, and you have to be able to move forward from it. Lesson nine, fun is bad. Uh, also, I didn't mention it, but I kind of feel like these lessons ramp up into kind of like more and more unfamiliar territory. I'm pretty fun, I'm pretty happy about this one, pretty fun about this one. It's, uh, I really don't like the word fun, that's kind of it. When, I did at the beginning, but when you think of the word fun, it's incredibly hard to nail down what you mean when you say fun. Some people think napping is fun. Some people think sports are fun. Some people think eating is fun. You can have opposite activities that people think are fun. And it's kind of bizarre in this very open way. Like the word is just not well defined. And I think it's a garbage word because of that. What people, I think, really want is they want to be engaged. And that's something that's way easier to measure. If somebody's paying attention to something and somebody's actually playing it, then they're engaged. And that doesn't mean they have to be having fun. A lot of the things we've already kind of gone through, you know, niviarum and don't kill the cow, I mean, it could be fun to a degree, but they're not, like, super fun. It's more about these feelings that aren't quite pleasure. Like, you're kind of, you're engaged, but for different reasons. And the, the one I kind of use to demonstrate this is uh, most prominent game I think I've released, you must be 18 or older to enter, is a game about being a kid in the 1990s and looking at porn for the first time. So it's a horror game with no monsters, no violence, and no death. The goal of the game is to not be caught by your parents, and when you're playing the game in real life, you also get worried about people hearing you play this game. Because uh, there isn't ever a really good way to explain to somebody that you were just playing a game when, uh, when you're playing this one. But I wouldn't describe this as fun. Like, uh, we've been struggling to find a word for it, and I'm sure there's one, but it's not really even nostalgic. Because nostalgic is this, like, longing for a time in the past. And I've never met anyone that wants to be, like, a prepubescent kid trying to look through porn sites again. Like, that's just not a thing that people jones for. Uh, and also the game's kind of neat because it has this ASCII art. I'm not sure how viewable it is from out there, but uh, everything's ASCII, so you can't really make out what the images are either, which kind of helps put you in that role. Like, you kind of get it, but you also don't. And the final one, failure is okay, but, be more, but more than that, you should release what you failed at to everyone else in the world. <laughs>